Simon, uh, when you, before you moved to this home that you live in now, you lived in Pretoria, yeah. and uh, part of your house burnt down. All of it burnt down except for a little bit, yeah. And I remember phoning you, and, and <laughs> I said, Simon, how's it going? And he said, you said, my house is burning down. I said, gee, that's, oh, that's terrible. He's, no one have a house for me. <laughs> and then Gammon phoned you a few minutes later. <laughs> yeah. no, he said, uh, no, your house burned down. I said, when I have a bride, don't buck it around. <laughs> but you lost a lot, of, a lot of special things there. Yeah, all my, all my old um, uh, pictures and uh, it was Kruger, a couple of Kruger Rands were given to me. and oh, A lot of, lot of good stuff. And you've you got you, you to knock that off and just forget about that and carry on. Uh, it was, it was sad actually. Yeah. The British Open was something that uh, I know was, was uh, a big thing for you and a big thing I think for anybody who lived in, in, in Southern Africa because it was the one that we could kind of identify with and um, you firstly you had a hard time ever getting to play in it. Yeah, I, I, I did. The first of <laughs> you know, all sorts of pre-qualifying stories that you wouldn't believe but uh, uh, it was the only major we could play in, really, if you, if you think about it. So that was our top tournament, and uh, everyone tried to qualify for it. And eventually, in '71, when I won the South African Open, I got a, I got a, an invite. Well, not an invite, but I was qualified. And walking to the first tee, I, I uh, broke my leg on a, you know, in a rabbit hole. So that was that story. Then uh, uh, there was uh, other pre-qualifying nightmares, if you like. That where you you know you're leading by four and you did you really when you came out on tour you used to talk about the fact that you were going to win the British Open did you really believe that that was the one that you could win yeah I, I, I did I, that's the one I wanted well I wanted to win like everybody else but uh, that's that's the one I worked for I mean everything I did was just to win the British Open yeah the best I ever did was finish 19 not that bad was at Birkdale. yeah <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> And then after British Open, a couple of weeks later, we would we would go to probably the most beautiful place that we ever visited on tour, yeah. was Grand Circier. Yeah, and uh, it was just during the time when streaking had started. Well, you, you're talking about that incident in the bar now, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're bringing that bloody story up. Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you that story. I, I was uh, I was actually sharing a room with a fellow called Mike Shewitz. Yeah, I mean, you know Mike well, or did know Mike well. Uh, and I decided to go to the bar, but it was bloody cold outside, so I put on all this, on oh, my rain jacket and uh, long toms and shirts and two pairs of slacks, and, and you know, just to keep warm. Anyway, once we got in the bar, it was called the English pub, if you remember correctly, I went in the bar, sat in the corner, and uh, it was hot, so I started to peel off my, my rain jacket first, and then the jersey, and then the other jersey, and the uh, clothes came off. Eventually, I had this pile of clothes in the, in the corner there, like, and I, I, I still think it was Sam Torrance, but he's, he's denied it. Bet me, you know, we'd had a couple now by this time, and, and he bet me five pounds that I wouldn't get all my gear off and keep it all off for 15 minutes. So I said, you're right. So we t I took all my gear off and, uh, there, you know, sat around there, and of course the, the word had got round outside that there was some bloody madman in the, in the, in the thing. There was no gear on the old ladies were coming in to have a look and uh, anyway the barmaid said to me please you know, just just put your underpants back on so we stuck the underpants on the head because it wasn't allowed <laughs> I'd lose my five pound and uh, then the 15 minutes was up and off we went yeah did you ever pay for a drink there again no I got free drink there for at least five years after that and a European tour committee tried to find you yes that was an interesting thing because the next day you know Mike Shevitz was a lawyer and the next day, I, I got this word from, I think, Tony Jacklin said, listen, hey, you're, 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 you've been misbehaving, we need you to be disciplinary here. And there was Peter Ustas, I think, Jacklin, Neil Coles, and Di Reese. Now, Di Reese was, he was fierce. I mean, he, he, wanted, he wanted my guts for garters. Anyway, I, I took Mike with me, Shewitz, and I sat him there, and, uh, and so I told him I don't say a word. And they said, well, uh, uh, you know, you were last night. You were you took all your clothes off, and you were misbehaving, and you you were you know degrading the PGA and all this kind of stuff. And I said, no, by the way, who's this guy? And she said, oh, that's my lawyer. 
He's a uh, Mike said, "What's the lawyer? I, I need him just here to witness you four of you. I brought my oak." And eventually, I said to uh, Di, "Listen, uh, uh, I wasn't at the club. I was. Uh, I can do what I damn well like after hours, not on the premises." Uh, and eventually, I think Peter Wister said, you know, he's, he's actually quite right. But they thought uh, <laughs> my, my, my lawyer was going to sue them if they, if they, if they gave me a fine. So anyway, so, they let me off. It was also true that uh, they were worried that the evidence wouldn't stand up in court. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, were you, were you, when you first went to America, were you intimidated by Jack Nicholas's and the... Tom Watsons and the Tom Weisskopf of the world? Well, I was more intimidated while I was in Europe, you know. Uh, that's why I would never went and played in America, because I thought, you know, you've got to go through those schools and then, you, then you've got to, then you've got to uh, make the cut and then you've got to try and beat guys like Weisskopf and, uh, and Nicholson. Uh, but uh, afterward, you mellowed out, you know. You, you think, well, well, we'll go and play as well as we can. And, and once I got there, uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that intimidated. After about a year, I wasn't that intimidated. It was when I first started. Now, they can also have bad days. You know, you, in your mind, you think these guys play great all the time. They, well, they don't play great all the time. But, they, uh, um, but uh, after a while, uh, I got confident that I could beat them every now and again. You're regarded as one of the great characters of golf. And, and two others that are in the same category as you are Lee Trevino and Chi Chi Rodriguez. Yeah. You must have had some fun together. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Lee, I think, uh, is... Uh, you're not, you're not short of conversation when you play with him, I can tell you that. He, he talks all the time. And, and Chi Chi, of course, is a very funny guy. He, uh, he's, uh, he's got mannerisms and, uh, and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, both bloody good men, actually. I'll tell you what, they're very nice guys. But they, they, they've got a sense of humour. I played with them both, actually, one day in Pensacola. The three of you together? The three of us in a practice round, in, in a practice round. And we, uh, we were playing the 10th hole and they were setting up the... the, 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 the uh, the uh, village and the, uh, behind the tent there, you know, and there were all these portalettes. There were a hundred portalettes being put up there. And uh, Chichi Rodriguez said to uh, Trevino, he said, uh, they better take those away by bloody Tuesday because by Monday there'll be Mexicans living in those, uh, in those toilets. And as quick as a flash, he said back to, to uh, uh, Chichi, he said, and, and, and by, by Wednesday there'll be four or five Puerto Ricans living in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I am Sam Torrance and uh, Simon Hobdate is just one of the funniest men on the planet. And there's so many stories to tell about Simon. My best one and my favourite one was when he was late for his tee off time on the Champions Tour and he gets stopped doing like 110 uh, by the state police and he's pulled into the side and he looks in his mirror and this huge state policeman gets out of the car got the big stats and on the gun and everything. He strolls up to the side of the car and he looks down and Simon says, God damn it, boy, I've been waiting all day for someone like you. And Simon just looked at him and says, well, I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> he actually let him off too. A very funny man. Millions of stories. <laughs>